Good evening and welcome to uh, <laughs> Minneapolis. <laughs> I have been looking forward to this evening's performance ever since 7.30, <laughs> two weeks ago. We are going to have an intermission pretty soon. Come right in, please. Pardon me, pardon me, pardon me, pardon me. <laughs> pardon me, pardon me. Where do you come from? Where? Oh, you don't know each other. I come from Copenhagen, I was here before you. <laughs> but anyway. Are there any children in the audience? Yes? Okay. Out. <laughs> we do have some children here, that means I can't do the second half in the nude. <laughs> I wear the tie, <laughs> the long one, <laughs> the very long one, yes. <laughs> I have a request. I usually do not do request numbers, unless, of course, I have been asked to do so. And that has happened. I have a request from a lady who called me at the hotel. She said, Mr. Boogie, <laughs> would you be kind enough to play? And then she could remember the title of the thing she wanted to hear. So I said, perhaps you could um, hum it or sing it for me. And if I know it, I will play it. And she said, well, I can't remember how it goes. And then she said, you are the musician. You ought to know the piece. I said, I'm sorry, I can't help you in, in, in this instance. And she said, it really doesn't matter because I'm not going to be there tonight. <laughs> so now I'm going to play something else. Yeah. I'm going to play a little piece by a Danish composer, uh, Mozart. <laughs> Hans Christian Mozart. <laughs> As you know, many of you know, Mozart was only from here up. <laughs> you have seen replicas of Mozart, of course. Mozart was what we call a bust. <laughs> and stood on many pianos and in, in windows and things. And the scholars insist that in spite of that physical handicap, Mozart was fairly happily married. <laughs> but Mrs. Mozart wasn't. He went all the way to the floor. <laughs> I'm going to play a composition he wrote in four flats because he had to move three times. <laughs> yeah. He never stayed long enough in any of them to finish this piece. And this is called a bagatelle, and it's in the key of C. But who cares? <laughs> I hope you will enjoy it. And if you don't, there's absolutely nothing I can do about it. <laughs> Why were you so late?
you know, three petals, they only have two feet. Bagatell in the key of C. <laughs> now, where the heck is C? <laughs> you didn't mark the C. understand why so many people in America say, long time, no see. <laughs> Isn't it a shame these big fat opera singers always lean against the pianos and bend them? <laughs> well, they're heavy arias. <laughs> Mozart. I'm always asked to play something straight. And you know it is not easy. <laughs> oh, my time is up. <laughs> Sorry, upside down. My grandfather gave me this one a few minutes before he died for 20 bucks. <laughs> Plus tax. <laughs> he was a Danish inventor. He invented the soft drink, which he called four up. <laughs> but the Danes didn't care for that. So he added some sugar, I think, and then he called it five up. Still no good. Then he tried once more, and that time he called it six up. <laughs> yeah, but no luck, so he finally gave up and died heartbroken. <laughs> Little did he know how close he came. <laughs> Come right in. Pardon me, pardon me, pardon me, pardon me, pardon me. You haven't missed much. <laughs> but I'm afraid you will never know who gave me this watch. <laughs> oh. And don't tell them. As a matter of fact, he added something to music, my grandfather. He wasn't very musical, and uh, he was not a composer, but he, he wrote this. And that is very important, because without this, we should never have had this. I gave my first concert at eight, or a few minutes after eight, because, <laughs> um, <laughs> <as> you know. <laughs> yeah. For 12 years I was concertizing, and I often had an opportunity to do an encore, which I generally did early in the evenings. <laughs> yeah. 
so that people, when they left early, could hear some of the encores of these. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some of my favorite encores were a series of Viennese waltzes by a Japanese, by a, uh, um, just, Was that serious? <laughs> I said, um, Japanese, I speak, there are three things, you know, I must tell you, there are three things I can never remember. <laughs> Four. I speak a little Japanese, and you know how I learned to speak. Of course you don't, but there's a wonderful method which I will tell you about, with which you can speak or learn to speak any language you wish or anything you want to learn, while you sleep. Not here, of course, but just. <laughs> Under the pillow in your bed, or in any bed, you put a cassette player. And then you insert a tape on which must be what you wish to learn, of course. In my case, it was lessons in the Japanese language. And then you run it every night until you have absorbed subconsciously what is on the tape. It may take weeks or months, maybe a year, but that's the way I learned to do it. I know you won't believe it, of course, but this is true. I don't speak it perfectly well, but I can get along, and I have been doing so. Unfortunately, I can only speak it when I'm sound asleep. <laughs> But uh, I remember words like uh, Toyota. <laughs> Here's a good word. Negi, N-E-G-I. Negi means onion in English. Negi, Negi. Two onions. <laughs> Such an easy language. I mention this particular word because if you ever are near a Japanese person who has eaten onions and it kind of bothers you, <laughs> just say, Negi Negi. <laughs> They're so polite, they would immediately say, Aso? And back up. <laughs> and then they will take your picture. But remember, they are not very tall people, so they only get you from here down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The rest is Mozart. <laughs> well, actually, I'm going to play a little of the songs, encores I was speaking about. Um, so these Viennese waltzes. As a matter of fact, it is very difficult, you know, to choose a musical program for an audience who is not present on account of a specific musical program, such as a Bach <laughs> recital, for instance. <laughs> First of all, which Bach? <laughs> <coughs> Johann? Sebastian? <laughs> Often? I have found that generally half an audience likes a little of this kind of music and the other half likes a little of that kind of music. And so I'm going to play a little of this kind and I am going to play a little of that kind. So that it will be something for each one of you to enjoy. I have a problem, as you have noticed, pronouncing TH, particularly when they are close together. It's easy, not easy when you have to learn to speak English and you're not brought up in an English-speaking country. You have to stick out your tongue. Thou, thy, the things like that. <laughs> you have to stick out your tongue. You never know how far, you know. <laughs> in Denmark, where I grew up, we speak way back here. <laughs> but that's just a small country and we don't have much room to fool around in. 
And it's cold in the winter time over there, I can assure you. And we don't stick out anything unless we are certain to get it back in again. <laughs> Well, I have some music here on the piano bench, a little of this and a little of that. And that's what I'm going to play a little of. <laughs> I can assure you, I play far better by ear. <laughs> bang, bang. Oh, this is supposed to be a, a book, not loose sheets. Well, I'm sorry, we've had to... You care for piano music? Here's some... That'll be 85 cents. <laughs> do you read music? You do? Then it'll be a dollar fifty. This is supposed to be a little this and a little that. This. See, these are all this is. There's not a single that among these. The one I gave you, is that a this or a that? Oh, that's a this, you keep that. What's that? Oh, that's a this also. Said. This, is. this, that goes between those this is. Thus. That's that. No, actually, that's a this, but you don't, you don't know the difference. My, my glasses, my glasses, they're not in the piano. Oh, a stagehand. Oh, no. a neighbor. Well, who doesn't? But he, he is our next window neighbor because we do not have a door in that end of the house. I'll give you five seconds more on that one. He is a physician, a good friend of the family, his own of course. And I went to see him and he said, you need glasses. So on the way out of his office, I took his. <laughs> and now he wants to see me when I get back home. But he can't because I got the glasses. <laughs> you know, the doctor told me that, and he's a doctor, he knows what he's talking about. He said, a person with one eye can see more than a person with two eyes can see. And I doubted that, of course, but he said that's true. Because the one with one eye can see the other person's two eyes. Whereas the person with the two eyes can only see the other. That's what he said.
sorry. <laughs> well, I'm sorry about that. Will somebody come and help me, please? I need somebody to turn the pages for me. Anybody. You work here? Oh, I thought you were breathing. <laughs> What do you do? I call the lights. I beg your pardon? I call the lights. <laughs> I don't think you heard me. I said, what do you do here? I call the lights. You call the lights. And that's what you do. <laughs> what do you call the lights? <laughs> you don't know? I do. <laughs> Bulbs. <laughs> what, happen, what happens if the lights don't come when you call them? <laughs> you don't know that? I do. Long time no see. <laughs> I run the lights. You what? I run the lights. You run the lights. That's against the law. That's against the law. Are you afraid of losing your hand? You're holding on to it. You make your own clothes? That's nice. That's the problem. I like that. <laughs> so what can I do for you? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Would you be kind enough to turn the... I forgot all about... Would you turn the pages for me? Yes, we do do that. Thank you. Nice fellow. Must have fertilized him a lot because he's so tall. <laughs> That's the light sometimes. <laughs> Wait a minute. It's when I'm playing, of course. I should have told you that. I'm sorry. Pardon me, madam, are you laying eggs? <laughs> okay, this is a nice piece. Nagy, nagy. gives me a chance to tell you what to do and where to do it. This is a nice piece. No, she'll be kind enough to do it. 
It begins here, and it comes up here. And here it says PP, but don't pay attention to that because that means pianissimo. That is an Italian abbreviation. Just the opposite of. So, so when I say now, you take this in this corner, a single sheet, and you turn it zoop like that. You don't have to say zoop, you can just zoop like that. Okay? But take it up here, otherwise you block my view if you put it down there. As simple as that. I need the back of it, you see. And then I go over here and finish that. It's as simple as that. One single sheet. One. This is Liebestraum by Fliss. No, no, that's F. Fliss. 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 No, it's F. Fliss. F. Fliss, young man, is Fliss. You don't say M. Ozart. Liebestraum by Fliss. I hope you will enjoy it. Put a foot on one of those presents. Uh, too far, too far. Okay, press down, press, press, like this. Boom, 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 boom. That's it. American folk song, 5.30 in the morning, from the wild, wild west. Marilyn Mulvey. Excuse me, what happened to your arms? 
There might be a Mozart for it. But... <laughs> Marilyn has sung in many operas and has also not sung, sung in many operas. <laughs> also not sung in many operas. Yes, she sung in many operas and has also not sung in many operas. That's uh, exactly what I meant and that's exactly what I said. Hands off, please. <laughs> She has a habit. You shouldn't lean against the pianos, Marilyn, because sometimes there might not be a pina piano, a piano next to you when, when you sing. Maybe a flute player. You can't hang on to the flute. <laughs> yeah, you can't flout the flute. Yeah. Marilyn is celebrating. Actually, today she's celebrating her second wedding anniversary. Is that true? Yeah. That's really an event. How long were you married? <laughs> oh, two years, yes, that's, I, I see, that's what it is, yeah. That's the second anyway. <laughs> Hands off, please. <laughs> what have you chosen to sing for us this evening? Yes, I'd like to start with a folk song. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, one of the folk songs your uncle brought from, from where? Croatia. Croatia. Yeah, that's right. Her uncle is an archaeologist and has been archaeologizing recently <laughs> in the very far where Croatia is. And uh, he found in an old monkery in the basement of <laughs> the ba <It's> monastery. Well, <laughs> oh, you can say nunnery. Why can't you say monkery? But well, anyway, that's not my problem. <laughs> but anyway. Ah, yeah. Hands up, dude. <laughs> Melanie's uncle brought back some manuscript he found in that, uh, wherever it was. And uh, there are six songs, and Marilyn sings uh, all six. Not now, but she knows them all. These are some old folk songs for the old folks, uh, for some uh, old folks. And uh, which one have you chosen to sing tonight, Marilyn? I wasn't sure. What do you think I should start with? Sing the one you like the most. Oh, yes. Because I'm going to play the one I like. <laughs> No, no, I, I try not to. Marilyn, she wants me to say, don't hum along because, you know, musicians, when we play, when you play a concerto, you sit there, and you sing along without really knowing it. You hum, or the violins, they do all these things. And I have the habit myself, and I must remember, not hands off. This is one of those songs, or two of Maggie, because... And if you don't know the song you're going to sing, don't sing it. <laughs> you're an opera singer. You should sing opera. Marilyn is a cagliatura. <laughs> and she said, why don't you sing an aria from 
one of this. You, you like Arias? Wait till you hear what she's going to say. Thank you. When this ovation has died down. <laughs> what have you chosen to sing then? Yes, I'd like to sing the Caro Nome from Brigoletto. Oh, God. <laughs> All right, for the ones of you who are staying, <laughs> Marilyn will sing the Kagame, the what? The Kaganomi. Kaganomi aria from the opera Rico Mortis. <laughs> by, by all means. <laughs> who wrote that, Marilyn? Uh, Giuseppe Verdi. Why? I mean, why yes? Why yes? Why yes? That's an expression. Why yes? It's your language. I'm just trying to use it. That's all. Why yes? Giuseppe Verdi. Joe Green to you. <laughs> Hands up, please. should take long. <laughs> Not if I can help it. What's the matter? Don't you know it? <laughs> oh, one more. It's mine. mine. Sorry.
We do have an agreement. She doesn't touch my piano. I don't lay hands on her coloratura. <laughs> You just said that. <laughs> Twice. I thought you had that fixed. ago in Denmark we had inflation and you are familiar with that problem. I invented a language which I call inflationary language. In inflation we have numbers rising. The prices go up. Anything that has to do with money goes up. Except the language. See we have hidden numbers in the words like wonderful, before, Create tenderly. All these numbers can be inflated and meet the economy, you know, by rising to the occasion. I suggest we add one to each of these numbers to be prepared. For instance, wonderful will be tutorful. Before should be B5. Create pre nine. Tenderly should be elevenly. A lieutenant will be a little Lebanon. <laughs> a sentence like I ate a tenderloin with my fork will be I nine and a lemon with my five. <laughs> <laughs> and so on and so forth. <laughs> I have a book here I brought and I will read. This is an old book my father inherited from two of his cousins. I will talk to you about that later when we get to that. I have a story here I'd like to read to you so you can get an idea of inflationary language, how it sounds when it's being used. Twice upon a time, there lived in sunny California a young man named Bob. He was a third little Lebanon in the U.S. Air Fives. <laughs> Bob had been fond of Anna, his one and a half sister, ever since she saw the light of day for the second time. <laughs> and they were both proud of the fact that two of his five fathers <laughs> had been among the creninders of the U.S. Constitution. 
They were dining on the terrace. Anna, he said, as he took a bite of a marinated herring, you look to the full three nights. <laughs> you never looked that lovely P5. <laughs> Anna really looked to the full in spite of the illness from which she had not yet recuperated. <laughs> yes, repeated Bob, you look to the full three nights. But you have three of the saddest eyes I have ever seen. <laughs> the table was tastefully decorated with Anna's favorite flowers, three lips. <laughs> they were now talking about Anna's as a ten husband, from whom she was separated. <laughs> While on the radio in Iris, eleven or sang tea for three. It was midnight. A clock in the distance struck 13. <laughs> and suddenly, there in the moonlight, stood her husband, done two. He was done one. There stood her husband, done two, obviously intoxic minded. <laughs> Anna, he blurted, five give me. I'm only young twice. And you are my two and only. <laughs> Bob jumped to his feet. Get out of here, you three-faced triple-crosser. <laughs> well, Anna warned, watch out, Bob. He is an officer. Yes, he is two, but I'm two, three. <laughs> Any two for elevenists? <laughs> All right, said Don Tu, as he wiped his five head. <laughs> he then left, and when he was one and a half way through the revolving door, he mumbled, I'll go back to eleven to see. <laughs> and be double again. <laughs> Farewell, Anna. Three to loo, three to loo. I'm going to introduce a young pianist. He is a very, very good friend of mine. He is an Armenian, and he has studied at the music conservatory in uh, Istanbul, the uh, Bull, Istanbul. <laughs> he has also graduated in chemistry. He is an excellent chemist, and uh, he has just returned from a very successful concert tour, an extensive concert tour in uh, South America, in Bolivia, and uh, <laughs> Bolivia, Bolivia, and has just returned today. And I must tell you, <laughs> he's a pianist, and the funny thing happened where he was supposed to play in Bolivia. He came to the concert hall and <laughs> They didn't have a piano, but the piano was silent. <laughs> so he did some uh, chemistry <laughs> for the audience. And uh, where the concert hall used to be <laughs> is now just a, a big hole in the ground. <laughs> but fortunately, he is saved himself. Would you please welcome Mr. Shahan Azruni? That's all that's left of him after the age. <laughs> he used to be a little man. Anyway, <laughs> Shahan, uh, Shahan lives in New York City with his family and has not been in the United States very long. And uh, uh, he doesn't speak English. He understands a little. Uh, fortunately, I speak a little Turkey, so he, I, I can understand, I, he understands me and I... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
We will play together because the time is very precious. We, we don't have much time, otherwise we would play two pianos, but uh, we cut it down to one piano. <laughs> We will play the second Hungarian Rhapsody by Liszt. <laughs> the second. <laughs> The, the Magic Flute, Mozart's great opera. I found in, in my research an opera 
actually written by Mozart, but it said Salieri <laughs> on it. But it is understood that Mozart actually wrote it, so you can imagine what kind of opera it is, and put Salieri's name on it. <laughs> well, anyway, I'll tell you a little about it because it's quite interesting. It is in, in one act only. It begins with a 45 minutes intermission <laughs> because it's such a short opera. And when it, the curtain rises, first you hear the overture, but when the tour is over, the curtain rises, of course. Otherwise you couldn't see a thing. And on the stage are two large trees. One is on this side and one is on the other side. And that indicates a small forest. Now the tenor comes in, he's supposed to meet his soprano, but she hasn't arrived yet, so he hides behind one of the trees in order to surprise her when she comes in a little later, which she does. And when she comes in a little later, which she does, she can't find him because he is hidden behind the tree. And she doesn't know that. Of course she knows it because she must have seen it during rehearsals. <laughs> but she pretends. Either that or she's plain stupid. <laughs> well, she now hides behind the other tree, waiting for him, and he's there already, so this is a little mess. Now the chorus comes in, but nobody knows why except Mozart, and he's dead. Finally, her father shows up. He's very angry because he just wants to get out of the opera as fast as possible and go home. <laughs> and he decides that she must die, and she sings her, die ar her death aria. And uh, that's the end of that. The curtain falls, but not hard enough. And uh, I'll take you to the opera and play for you the overture. First, you hear the conductor's footsteps when he enters the orchestra pit. As a matter of fact, I like to call it the orchestra ditch. <laughs> That's a little more dignified, I think. <laughs> pit. First you hear the conductor's footsteps when he enters the orchestra pit, or ditch. <laughs> he walks sideways, because it's a very narrow ditch. And this is the overture. This was the first part of the overture. Now you're going to hear the second part, and that's exactly the same. that extra blip is that the fellow who does the blips started one measure too late. <laughs> now the curtain rises and the tenor comes in from that side in a single file. I'll tell him. <laughs> yeah. He can't wait. He is anxious to see her. Now, the leading lady comes in. She's supposed to fill the part of the soprano. She not only fills it, <laughs> she overflows it a little bit. She's a big, she's a big, uh, uh, she carries a lot of weight to the opera. Let's put it that way. She's about four and a half feet tall, lying down. <laughs> she comes in from that side in a single pile. Oh, 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 oh,
surrounds it completely. <laughs> well, while you were laughing, the chorus has been in and out, <laughs> and now a baritone arrives. But he finds out that he's in the wrong opera. <laughs> so he's fired. And now the father comes in, the ill bustle. up from there and sings her death aria. Whenever I would announce them from the stages in Europe where I played, where I concerts, the whole audience would go, bravo, bravo, because bravo played them much better than I do. <laughs> yes, he is Giuseppe Bravo, great pianist, and he is a, a Portuguese. Oh yes, he and his wife are Portuguese, but you can't have one geese. Well, I told you, it's your language. I'm just trying to do it. And they have three Portugoslings. One of each. When you hear this, That is the introduction to the war. Then when you hear this. That is the main theme of the war. Then when you hear this. Definitely something wrong. <laughs> because that's Chopin.
that one. Danish, Danish uh, lullaby. My mother used to play it for me when I was uh, a few years ago. And um, as a matter of fact, I never heard her playing it because I always fell asleep the moment she started it. <laughs> but I think it goes like this.
everything come to an end. You wouldn't believe it, would you? But this is it. This is what we have to offer. Some laughs and smiles. And coughs and hiccups. <laughs> so when once in a while a handkerchief comes out to wipe away a tear from laughter, that is my reward. The rest goes to the government. <laughs> Perhaps we shall meet again sometime. Maybe next time in your house. <laughs> Maybe in your dining room. Maybe in your living room. <laughs> Wherever your TV set is located. That <laughs> Thank my parents for having made this evening possible. <laughs> and my children for having made it necessary. <laughs> I have five children, by the way. Not by the way, I have five children. <laughs> That stupid page turner with the red tie happens to be one of them. <laughs> and there are four more like that. drive tonight, please drive extremely carefully. Extremely carefully. Because I walk in my sleep. <laughs> Stop that racket for a second. <laughs> On behalf of everybody involved in this evening's performance, from the management and from everybody backstage and in front of the stage and for all the artists who have joined me here on stage, I wish to thank you profoundly for the courtesy and the honor you have bestowed upon us by rising to the occasion. <laughs> 
I thought you were on your way out. <laughs> but in retaliation for your keeping me over time, I am going to do an encore. If I had known this, we could have started with it and... <laughs> well, anyway. I'm going to do a routine now. The ones of you who have heard... <laughs> must have cost a fortune to build this hall. For 15 cents more, I could have gone all the way over there. waste a beautiful flower, any flower, we don't waste anything. It's as beautiful as an artificial one. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to do a routine now. The ones of you who have heard it before may enjoy hearing it again. And the ones of you who have not heard it before may enjoy hearing it again next time. <laughs> I'm speaking of the phonetic punctuation. <laughs> well, I must compliment you on your endurance. <laughs> However, had I known this, as I said before, we could have started with it and been home by now. But I certainly appreciate your enthusiasm, indeed. I invented phonetic punctuate, punctuation many years ago. Punctuate, punctuate. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it was in 1936 when I first found that people who speak together don't understand each other clearly. But when we read or write, we use punctuation marks in order to underline the meaning of our sentences, but we do not have that support when we speak. So why not integrate punctuation marks by giving them sounds into our speech? Then we can underline what we intend to convey to each other verbally. Yeah. Now, what the heck was all that now? <laughs> <laughs> that was right. I'll teach you how to use the system. A period sounds like this. A dash. An exclamation point is a vertical dash with a period underneath. The comma. Quotation, not two commas. Or if you happen to be left-handed. <laughs> question mark is a little difficult. <laughs> and finally, the colon, the two little dots. You may put them over each other, you may put them under each other. You can put them wherever you want to put them. <laughs> That's it. I'm going to read a paragraph from a book I have here. The same book I wrote, I read from before. My father inherited that, I told you, from two of his cousins. They were twins. Identical twins. But they never knew which one of them was the identical one because they looked so much alike. <laughs> my father told me, oh, he was much older than I was, of course, because see, my father was born in 1847. He was 60 years old when I was born. So he was almost my grandfather. <laughs> He knew a lot of things that I didn't know, and uh, I know it now. <laughs> I wanted to show you a little thing. I have seven grandchildren, and the youngest one, when she was the youngest one, which isn't anymore because there are two more, but she was. She is now almost the oldest one, because not necessarily yet, but she's in, 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 in age, you know, it always changed. And this is uh, a thing she did in school for me. I always show that to the audience. That's good. I, I did a notebook. I write notes. Uh, 
cute from the school yeah. cost me eight thousand dollars <laughs> the one who came home <laughs> she was the one who came home from a beach party she was this big and she could hardly walk and I said are there many were there many children there oh yes she said many boys and girls I said were there more boys or more girls and she said she couldn't tell that because none of them had any clothes on <laughs> I have a short story right here in the beginning of the book Page nine. Oh. Page six. In the open window there suddenly came light. Beautiful Eleanor sat alone, dreaming of but one thing. Two years had passed since she met Sir Henry. She could still remember the unhappy evening when her father had thrown him out. <laughs> they had been sitting in the park and Henry had said, darling. <laughs> Is this the first time you have loved? <laughs> and she had answered, yes. <laughs> but it is so wonderful that I hope it shall not be the last. Suddenly she heard a well-known sound. It was he. In two stripes he was near her. Embraced, kissed, and caressed her. <laughs> Henry! <laughs> what is love? She asked. He answered. Without. <laughs> he asked, I'm sorry, <laughs> left handed, where have your thoughts been? And he answered, me, my maiden. Suddenly he had gone. Oops. All she heard, heard. All she heard was the well-known sound of his departing horse. 